Thank you. Thank you. Come down a bit. That's it. Lovely. Right. This is. There's quite a lot of stuff. Shh. There's quite a lot of stuff in this lecture. Uh, I'm going to pose a question for you fairly early on uh, to, to think about as we go through, and then we'll examine the question at the end. And when I say examine, I mean explore. Sorry. Um, so uh, this is the, the core of this lecture. I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about the phases of regulation, some of which I've mentioned. It's bringing in an idea, an important idea, of the phases of regulation of gut function. So that's an important idea which I'm going to do first. Uh, then I'll introduce something about celiac disease, which we'll come back to at the end. And then I'll talk about digestion of the various components. Now, when I come to digestion, carbohydrate is okay. That's a simple, and but it's of its kind, it's important. Protein is very simple. I shall slide past that because essentially it's the same mechanisms of carbo as carbohydrate. When we come to do fat, however, fat is not water soluble. Therefore, you need a whole range of different kinds of mechanism to handle it. It's difficult stuff. So I spent quite a lot of time on that. Water and ions, simple enough. Deal with that in three minutes, and then we'll have a bit of fun at the end. So. Breakdown of complex molecules. We need to address which enzymes are used. Um, and we need to consider how material gets into the cells, out of the cells, and into the blood. So there are four elements. Digestion, movement in, movement out, and how does it get into the blood. So I'll produce summary slides as we go along, emphasizing those four elements as we go along. So that's the idiot's guide to digestion. Right. Uh, overall, let me just uh, look at the complexity of these things. There are two kinds of input uh, into the uh, control of the gut. There's the external influences. That's mostly mediated by your central nervous system, the upper bits, how you feel, whether you're hungry, whether you're sad, whether you're happy, all of those things. Um, and then there are the local changes in the gut. Uh, and those we can divide into three sections, as we'll see. Those controlled by the stomach, sorry, two sections. Those controlled by the stomach, the gastric phase, and those controlled by the intestine, the intestinal phase. And the general principles are that you've got receptors of various kinds. You could make that up in there. And they act in various ways through the uh, extrinsic autonomic nerves, that's to say the nerves outside the gut, like the vagus that we've spoken about. Those are from the central or autonomic nervous systems. We can operate through the intrinsic nerve plexuses, the nerves within the gut, below each layer of muscle in the gut. We looked at uh, yesterday or the day before. Oops, just... And then the lastly, the hormonal mechanisms, or as I've called them in this caption here, the humoral or hormonal mechanism. Humoral is a rather old word. Essentially it means chemicals or something, meaning chemicals, that sloshes around through the blood and is a signaling system through there. So the hormonal mechanism. And they act on the various effectors, that is to say smooth muscle, the exocrine glands for secretion, and the endocrine gland cells, and those produce the various effects. So that's your schema of the complexity of the gut. Now I just want to introduce, well, before I move on, that's the function of all these things, is to maintain the contents of the gut. In other words, ideally empty. So everything digested and moved on. <coughs> Let me take you back in time uh, some mm, yeah, 100 years, a bit more perhaps. Who's heard of Pavlov? Stick your hand up if you've heard of Pavlov. Oh, you have. Oh, lots of you have heard of Pavlov. Shall I tell you how many of the allied health scientists have heard of Pavlov? About a third. It's about 60% of you. So you're, you're ahead. I just want to use Pavlov, because he's interesting anyway, uh, to explain one of the particular phases of regulation. This is Pavlov's classic experimental setup. It's very simple. He has a dog, an unanesthetized dog, gently restrained, as you can see, just to stop it jumping off the table. And it's rigged up to collect saliva. 
So as it secretes saliva, it's collected and it's measured. So you can measure the rate of flow of saliva in response to a whole variety of stimuli. And these experiments went on for decades, hugely complicated, getting progressively more complicated. Well worth reading if you had nothing else to do, um, because they're beautiful experiments. I'm going to describe the basic experiment and then hint at another one just for fun. Here's the basic experiment. You all know, or if you don't know, you'll probably believe me if I tell you, that if you put down, what's he called? It's called Rover. Ah, would be, wouldn't he? If you put down Rover's food, Rover dribbles. That's what dogs do when confronted with food. It's what we all do when confronted with food. Dogs are just less decorous than we are. So the dog salivates. Saliva is produced and there's a rate of flow associated with producing food. If, however, you ring a bell, Rover does not salivate because a bell doesn't mean anything. It's a neutral stimulus as far as a dog is concerned. If, however, you ring the bell every time you present the dog with food, the dog learns to associate the sound of the bell with food. And you only sound the bell when food is produced. So it's an association. That produces what Pavlov called a conditioned reflex. So that eventually you can get to the stage where you ring the bell on its own without the stimulus of food and the dog salivates. So you now have a conditioned reflex. It's inappropriate behaviour for a dog, but dogs are pretty slow on the uptake. But they, it can be learned and it can be unlearned. That's the conditioned reflex. Now, apart from being physiologically interesting, that actually is part of a foundation of a huge part of psychology, not a very respectable part of psychology, uh, and a lot of that is associated with various kinds of learning behaviour. So it was hugely important, and he got a Nobel Prize for his trouble in the night sometime in the 1920s. So there you are. That's the condition we expect. What this is illustrating for our purposes in the gut is that the central nervous system, the upper part of the central nervous system, <coughs> regulates uh, gut function. In this case, salivary function. You could probably, uh, nowadays you could repeat the experiment and you could probably uh, generate all sorts of other, uh, or recognise all sorts of other gut responses that are being mediated by this same mechanism. Let me take you just, the, the, here's the fun experiment now, possibly a little cruel. Um, Pavlov did various stimuli, and he compared stimuli. He sometimes used noxious or harmful stimuli as well. So one thing he did was, he got a circle. He, every time he displayed a circle, it, was, it became the conditioned positive response associated with food, <coughs> dog salivates. You present the dog with an oval, you get no food. So circle food, oval, no food. Conditioned, quite separate responses. Now, as you know, a circle is a kind of specialised oval where the two centres have come together. So what he did was vary the axes of the ellipse or oval, and so it got more and more circular. And when the ratios of the axes got to about 11 to 12, which is very close to circular, uh, what did the dogs do? They had a nervous breakdown. They couldn't tell the difference anymore. They didn't know whether they should dribble or they shouldn't dribble, so they showed all the outward and visible signs of a nervous breakdown and went, Beresque. Uh, so they had to be reconditioned so they didn't go beresque anymore or keep them away from squashed circles. Um, <laughs> but it's an idea of how you get confusion in the brain and it causes what we recognise as nervous breakdown, whatever that is. See psychology for lots more of that stuff. Anyway, the point is cephalic phase of regulation. So I, I recognise three phases and I'm going to summarise them here. Um, <coughs> of regulation. There's the cephalic phase, central nervous system, meaning the top bits. There's the gastric phase, signals essentially from the stomach, intestinal phase, signals from the intestine. So we'll do a quick compare and contrast. Remember you've got, have got the slides with a white background. Not, uh, not daft, you know. I did remember to do it. Um, on the whole, the cephalic uh, phase is the anticipatory element of it. Now, not solely anticipatory, but we, it's easy to imagine that, that if you're hungry and thirsty and you go in the front door of your house and there's a great waft of something lovely coming down the hall uh, and somebody else has cooked it even better, 
and you just hear the sound of a cork being drawn, perhaps, uh, you might well salivate and your gut might get very excited. Uh, so those are very positive stimuli. Now you can have negative ones. If you're disgusted by something, or revolted, or extremely sad, then you might suppress. Or if you're very stressed, <coughs> most of you will be mildly stressed most of the time. Some of you will be very stressed some of the time, probably. It's normal. Um, for medics, that is. And uh, students generally who are fairly tend to be quite stressed some of the time. Um, so it's an anticipatory <coughs> function involving higher bits of the brain. So it's on the whole fairly positive. So you can stimulate gastric secretion via the vagus and the intrinsic nerves and via gastrin uh, secreted from the pylorus. I haven't time to tell you about Beaumont and Fletcher, uh, which is two uh, Canadian, whatever they were, medics out in whatever Canada calls the bush. Somebody will have to enlighten me, one of the Canadians sometime, uh, out in the, the outback or whatever it is. And they found this guy with a bullet wound to his abdomen, which exposed the inside of his stomach. So they hired him for several years, you might say they kept him prisoner, and did all sorts of lovely experiments. And you can show that the stomach blood flow increases and the stomach secretes with positive stimuli and doesn't secrete with negative stimuli. So you can do all of that. Did all sorts of exciting experiments. Beaumont and Fletcher, again worth looking up. The gastric phase is stimuli in the stomach, particularly peptides, that's to say the, bro the breakdown product of proteins, uh, distension of the stomach and various substances w that we use uh, as aids to digestion. We use alcohol, at least some of us do, uh, and caffeine are both used as aids to digestion because they both stimulate secretion in the stomach. So that's kind of artificial, but those are the signals particularly. And the mechanism, the same mechanisms as before. Um, and the intestinal phase, stimuli in the intestine. We've talked about distension, we've talked about peptides and amino acids, and probably fats as well we could add to that. So fats and distension of the small intestine. Uh, they, that will act, uh, the top two act with gastrin, which regulates from the duodenum this time, which uh, affects uh, gastric function, and those hormones, um, CCK, act for, to increase bile flow and generally get, get rid of fats in there. So you can see there are three phases of digestion, three areas of regulation, central, gastric, intestinal. It's helpful to keep them fairly separate uh, and then put them together afterwards. Right, here's our running question. Celiac disease is relatively common in Ireland. It's familial and it's quite common in the west of Ireland. Um, I have more to say about it later. But if you have a look, uh, you stick a gastroscope or an endoscope down inside some, down somebody's mouth, you swallow a tube, you shine a bit of light down, you have a sort of kind of telescope, you can look down and you can see this is the, what the normal gut looks like. Um, sorry, can I, do I need to put the lights down? Or is that all right? Down? All right. She says it's all right. She's right. Okay, fine. I noticed she was the sort of person who's always right. Uh, endoscopy, you have, go down and have a look at the living tissue in the gut and you can see these finger-like processes, the villi. That's normal gut. You can also grab a little claw and pinch some of the gut out of it and have a look. That's called a biopsy. I must change the colour of that script. A biopsy. So you pinch a little bit of tissue out and withdraw it, do your histology, and that's a nice normal bit of cut, gut. Uh, villi there and bits of crypt down in here. Perfectly normal. A few nice little goblet cells there. Look. Ah, sweet. Right. But if you have celiac disease, you get failure of proliferation in the crypt. That's the, that's the proximate lesion, if you like. You can go further back with the sort of intracellular stuff. For a celiac, you get this uh, absence of villi because there aren't, isn't the production of cells to sustain the villi. So you get a reduced number of villi or no villi at all. And if you look at the histology, there they are, lots of crypts, but no villi at all. So what are the consequences? Or what are the consequence, consequences of that likely to be? So I'd like you to carry that question with you through the rest of this lecture, and then we'll come back to it towards the end if things go well. The Students' Union hasn't put me out, um, and we'll come to that at the end. Okay, so digestion, basic principles, always stay with the basics. Carbohydrates, abbreviated CHO for your benefit. Uh, that's the sequence. 
polysaccharides, complex, stuck together molecules, broken down into disaccharides, that's to say two sugars stuck together, and then broken down into individual sugars. This is the form in which we use it. Sugar, individual sugars, glucose, fructose, and things like that, what we use. Proteins are big molecules. You break those down into peptides, small chains of amino acids, perhaps up to a dozen, uh, and then individual amino acids. Oh, somebody's phone again. Yeah, transplant time, off you go. Uh, number three, fats uh, come as triglycerides. They're broken down into monoglycerides and, and free fatty acids. Now, that's the core. Water and ions are already little. Don't need to worry about them. Don't have to do anything about them. Just absorb them. So the processes, there are four. Digestion, entering the gut cells, leaving the gut cells, and entering into capillaries. So that's the structure. That's what we're going to get. So if you hold the structure in your mind, then you can make up most of the rest. Right? So get the structure right, everything else will follow. <coughs> Right, here's carbohydrate digestion. Uh, and remember that protein digestion follows exactly this model. It's just the names of the enzymes are different. This is a picture of a complex polysaccharide, starch, sort of stuff that makes up bread. Uh, and here it is, it consisted lar consists largely of glucose monomers, lots of glucose molecules stuck together. It forms a complex branching <coughs> chain. Now, in order to be able to digest that, we've got to get it down to sh individual sugars, individual glucose molecules. Now, that's a two-stage process. The first stage is, as you see in this figure, to get them down uh, to disaccharides. In this case, maltose. Two glucoses makes a maltose. I, should have, I haven't got a crib sheet on there for that one. I'll put it on another time. There are two kinds of amylase, or starch-digesting enzyme, salivary and pancreatic. The Salivary amylase is trivial. It doesn't, in terms of digestion, it doesn't have any major important function in terms of digestion. Why not? Because it works at an alkaline or neutral pH. As soon as it gets into the stomach and gets exposed and mixed up with all that hydrochloric acid, it will cease to work. So it's negligible in terms of the digestion. So what's its function? Why bother to have this stuff up here if you're going to stop it working down here? Easy. You need to know what you're eating. So salivary amylase will digest starch in your mouth so you can taste it. And you can test that for yourself. You take a small piece of bread and you hold it in your mouth, chew it a little bit, hold it in your mouth on your tongue. You, it will taste of nothing to start with and very soon it will start to taste sweet because you're breaking down the polysaccharides into disaccharides, and you can taste those. Okay, so that's so salivary amylase is trivial, whereas pancreatic amylase, my arrows in there, there are arrows there, but I've forgotten to change the colour to from white to something else. So put your little arrows in. Uh, pancreatic amylase is important. It comes in from the pancreas to the duodenum, and it acts in the small intestine. So predominant uh, role, uh, part, predominant digestion starches and, and sugars, carbohydrates, is in the gut uh, by pancreatic amylase. So pancreas is incredibly important. So, okay, we've got these various amylases breaking down, and you get two kinds of molecule formed. You get maltoses formed, in this case, because of the breaking off at that kind of bond. But these are enzymes cannot act at these bonds around a, a branch. So you get these funny little chains uh, associated with them, and they are called limit dextrins. Now, they're not important other than to just deal with them. And how are we going to deal with them? We're going to have a special set of enzymes to deal with them in, on the lining of the gut. What are they going to be called? They're going to be called dextrinases. Of course they are. You could have made that up. You didn't need me to tell you that. So there is a special set of enzymes. We don't need to say anything more about those. If biochemists want to, that's good for them. Right, that's grand, let them at it. So mostly we shall simply talk about disaccharides. And they have their disaccharidases uh, in their right place. Let me just remind you of the structure of the gut. Uh, various cobbled bits of uh, Sherwood pictures. Here's a villus. There we are. Crypt in the side and all the blood vessels and lymph vessels inside. Here is one digestive, digestive and absorptive cell. Functions of the gut cells are digestion and absorption. 
Everybody remembers absorption as they try hard to forget digestion. The surface is thrown into folds, and here it is. Uh, it's an electron micrograph of that. That's the top of the cell. And here are the microvilli. I might take that label off next year because I don't like brush, the term brush border. Those are the microvilli on there. So, and you can see how close together they are. So they're a huge increase in surface area, 20-fold increase in surface area. So that's the business area for digestion. And here is uh, dear Laura Lee's diagram uh, for this. Uh, here are your uh, car carbohydrates coming in. And they're, they're being broken down at these places. Salivary amylase here and pancreatic right? pancreatic amylase later on. And they get broken down into these various kinds of disaccharides. There are only two. And they are then broken down on surface enzymes. Let's concern ourselves solely with moto, maltose for the time being. Maltose breaks down into two glucoses. It has an enzyme called maltase. Switch it off, please. Maltase. Um, I can't even be bothered to change it from the standard ring either. Shocking. <laughs> even I can do that. Uh, maltase is the enzyme that breaks down maltose. It breaks it down into two glucose molecules, and there they are, and they enter the cell. Uh, glucose and galactose enter the cells by secondary active transport. Now, just take your minds back a little way. Secondary active transport. In other words, no direct expenditure of energy is required. It piggybacks on another energy-consuming process. And that's sodium transport is taking place. So it, it gets into there. There's the sodium uh, glucose exchanger, if you like. Uh, so sodium pumping is an active process, as you know, crucial life function. And it pumps it in, but the glucose piggybacks and gets a ride in there. So does galactose, wherever it is. I can't see it on the slide. Writing's too small. Um, fructose enters the cells by facilitated diffusion. Just notice that F for fructose, F for facilitated. That's helpful. It took me years to work that out. I've given you it for nothing. Right, there you are. So, having got it into the cell, uh, it then passes out of the cell. Glucose, I think, by diffusion, has got carrier molecules. Fructose, as we'll see by uh, carriers, uh, and then diffuses into the capillaries. It's removed by the capillaries, so there is always a gradient. So it's a gradient through the cell, and it draws it through. So that's easy. Summary, digestion, oops, how did that get there? Sorry about that. <laughs> Polysaccharides to disaccharides, pancreatic amylases, several of them. Disaccharides to monosaccharides on the microvilli. Entry into gut cells, fructose gets there by facilitated diffusion. If you had nothing else to do, you could shade the F's red, which I think I did. Galactose go in by energy-dependent secondary active transport. That is to say, they piggyback on the, gray, on the sodium gradient. There are Gs in piggyback and gradient there, if you want them, the galactose, so that's easy. They leave the cells, first two down the gradient again, and secondary fructose is different, carrier-mediated transport. So there you are. They get into capillaries by diffusion. So that's your mechanism. That's carbohydrate digestion. Get all the phases, the four phases right, and it's easy enough to do. Now, what I haven't put on there, which I should have done, is a little crib to remind you, for those who don't know, which of the disaccharides has which sugars in. So you just might sort that out for yourselves. Uh, which, uh, lactose has galactose and so on. Um, so just sort those out. I haven't put them on the slide I meant to. <laughs> right. Now, protein digestion is almost exactly the same. There are no complexities, they're water soluble, they're easy to deal with. So you've got proteins go to peptides, we already know that's done by uh, pepsin, uh, which is activated by chlor hydrochloride of pepsin, and that's shown, I think, is it shown here? Yes. Pepsinogen, so they've even shown it splitting the O-gen off, pepsin splits that, and now that's called autocatalysis. So self Catalyzing, self breaking down, if you like, although it needn't be breaking down. That digests the pepsin, breaks down uh, peptides or proteins into peptide fragments or peptides into smaller ones, uh, and the acid also helps that process and the cells go in. So, uh, the pancreatic proteases are activated by enzymes on the wall of the duodenum. 
and they are called enterokinases. Entero meaning gut, kinase meaning an enzyme that works on an enzyme. So enterokinases activate these proteases and then you get autocatalysis, just the same as pepsinogen and pepsin. So that's grand. <laughs> so it's, and the rest is the same. Now, let's get complicated. Let me take you back a little bit. At least I hope I'm taking you back. Uh, here is the pancreas lying just below the stomach and with its duct opening into the duodenum. Here is the bile duct coming down from the liver, which occupies the rest of the universe on this scale. Uh, and it joins, and there is a common duct with a sphincter, with a piece of smooth muscle that closes it. So we can control the secretion of these products. We can control their entry into the gut by that sphincter. So we've got bile. Now, as we'll see, bile is approximately continuously produced. We'll talk about that next day um, by the liver, and it's stored in the gallbladder, and we'll come to that in its place. The pancreas is complex because it contains both endocrine and exocrine portions. Now, it's important that you sort these out in your mind. Do it once and do it forever. It's not hard, I promise you. Um, here is the exocrine uh, portion, is like so. Secretory units on the ends of ducts, and they secrete into ducts. That's what exocrine means, secreting into a duct, secreting out onto a surface, in this case, the, line, the opening of the duodenum. So exocrine secretes through a duct. Now, uh, and that means you've got secretory units which are approximately spherical, and each one of those is called an acenos. And here is a picture of a real one, so to speak, a histological picture, a circular cluster of cells. It's a section through an approximately a sphere. There's the duct in the middle, going through into the, uh, the larger duct. So it's an acenos. Uh, that means there are two kinds of cell. There are the, the acinar cells, here they are, and they secrete the digestive enzymes. Amylases, lipases, proteases. That's all you've got. Three types, that's all you need. Um, they secrete those into the duct. The duct cells, a bit further in, they secrete a watery bicarbonate solution. Now isn't that convenient? What do you know about bicarbonate? Yes, you know it's an alkali. Yes? <coughs> is alkaline. So if you secrete that into the duodenum, you will neutralize the acid coming down from the stump. You know, kind of all that acid sloshing around it burn holes in you. So the duct cells produce bicarbonate. Now you're just going to have to learn those. AC need produce enzymes, duct cells produce bicarbonate. Uh, the other portion of the pancreas consists of these small clusters of cells called the islets. You needn't remember the dead white European male. The uh, pancreatic islets is a much better term. And there is one of, the, one of them in histology. It's the endocrine region, that is to say, it secretes hormones into the blood. Each of the cells is in contact with the capillary. It secretes into the blood. The principal hormones that we are concerned with in a couple of lectures' time will be insulin and glucagon, both of which are involved in the regulation of blood sugar concentration. I have a lot to say about that. So for the time being, I'm only concerned with the acinar, exocrine portion, this, this kind of region. So the enzymes there, uh, the duct cells, secretions via the duct, that's the definition. For years I asked a question, uh, something along, um, describe the secretion of the exocrine and endocrine portions and how do they get to their target organs or something like that. But I, I think I've given that one up for this year because it's, it's too boring and besides everybody was getting it right now. So I've dropped it for a couple of years. So if you repeat twice, it might come round again. Then again, it might not. Uh, if you're thinking of repeating twice, you probably won't be here. Um, right, digestion and absorption of fats uh, is different. Fats are not water-soluble. So that creates a whole new set of scenarios that we've got to deal with. If you've had your fine big Ulster fry for breakfast, which is really uh, a coronary on a plate uh, waiting to happen, or you had that Glasgow delicacy, um, a deep fried Mars bar, or deep fried anything else, I think is Glasgow cooking, isn't it? Um, then what happens is this large fat droplet lies on top of everything else in the stomach, at least it would if it was stationary. So you get a single large fat droplet. It's just like you've been cooking in a, in a frying pan, you've been cooking something with oil, and you 
add water to it. Do this when it's cold, not when it's hot, darling. It's dangerous to do it when it's hot. Um, then you get a pretty large fat droplet, or a few large fat droplets formed on the top. That's no good. We need lots of surface area if we're going to break this stuff down. So break it down. We must, and we need small droplets. Now, with your frying pan example, you put a couple of drops of washing up liquid in there, ecologically sound, of course, uh, and then it breaks the droplets up into lots of little ones. That's the principle of washing up liquid. Uh, and that's exactly what happens in the gut. So you get, here's our large fat droplet, too big to get it in the picture. Bile salts from the bile secreted in the liver uh, emulsify it, drive it into small droplets, and you see lots of small droplets there. They are charged, they're polar structures, they do that. Then you get, uh, having got them into small droplets, the pancreatic lipases, that's to say the fat digesting enzymes, lipid lipase, um, from the pancreas, will break that down into fatty acids, FA, and monoglycerides, NG possibly. Um, and many of those will aggregate with bile salts to form micelles, not Michelles, they're hairdressers. Uh, sorry, Michelles. One of these days there'll be a whole audience of Michelles out there. Must be. Anyway, not Michelles. There is no eight in my cells, please. Uh, if I had a pan for every one of those, uh, there you are. I'd be able to afford a bottle of lemonade. Um, my cells are water soluble. Now that's important. So this is a clever trick. You've now got something which is water insoluble, and you find a way of making it water soluble. You've turned them inside out, back to front, and there they are. They're water soluble, so they can move through the aqueous stuff in the gut. <coughs> Sooner or later, they will come fairly close to the surface of the microvilli, and they, they can then diffuse their free fatty acids and monoglycerides into the gut. <coughs> There's a micelle, not a Michel, but a micelle, and they've turned their little heads and tails that way to make them hydrophilic and hydro, hydrophobic cores, which is pretty obvious, really. Uh, and that's what, they, that's what they look like. They're little bubbles. Now, they are in equilibrium with the free fatty acids and microglycerides in the gut contents. So they will liberate their contents or take in contents, that's what an equilibrium means, according to the concentration gradients. So if they get close to the cell, where they're taking in free fatty acids and monoglycerides, they will liberate their contents and they'll be absorbed. So that's the important bit in there. Right. <coughs> Here's the, the intestinal bit. Large particles, bile salts have emulsified them, pancreatic lipases, turns them into mono monoglycerides, Free fatty acids. Free fatty acids is what we usually call them, but I'm lazy. Uh, they act with bile salts, they form my cells, and then, then they diffuse into the gut cells. Uh, that's so far so good. We've dealt with the, fat in so the water insolubility problem using my cells, um, and we've got the stuff into the cells. We need to be able to maintain the gradient, however, so what happens inside the cell Quite a lot of stuff happening inside the cell in contrast to carbohydrates and protein digestion. Uh, you get triglyceride synthesis. So they're stuck back together again to make triglycerides. I can only imagine that that is to maintain the gradient to continue to draw cells, uh, fatty acids and monoglycerides in. You package um, in the uh, Golgi, you package that up uh, the triglycerides up to make chylomicrons. This is a lipoprotein, or a lipoprotein if you prefer. Uh, so you stick some protein on it, turns it into a new structure called a chylomicron. There are the chylomicrons, and they are also water soluble. They've wrapped up the fat inside this protein case, uh, and they are exocytosed, if that's a verb. They leave the cells by exocytosis. They're squirted through the membrane. Uh, they would like to enter the uh, blood capillaries, but they can't. They're too big, and the capillaries are too impervious. So they go into the lacteals, the lymph vessels, instead. They are, have almost no basement membrane, much more permeable, so the chylomicrons enter into those, into the lacteals. The lacteals, the lymph vessels, are have valves in, they're also pulsatile in certain regions, they have what they call lymph hearts, and they eventually 
uh, push the, um, the fatty stuff through to the circulation where they join the circulation near the right atrium. So it eventually gets into the blood. So that's a much more complicated story than for carbohydrates. So let's have our little summary. Do you want me to go back? Sorry, put lots of people. Do you want me to go back or not? You're all right. Okay. Um, here's the summary slide. Firstly, digestion. Oh, I was sequencing a bit hazy this morning, a bit like myself. Bile salts, triglycerides, by pancreatic lipases, breaks them down to MGs and free fatty acids. Bile salts make my cells, uh, containing them, obviously they wrap them up. Entry into the cells, diffusion. Equilibrium with my cells helps. That's easy, that's the easy bit. Uh, it's not the my cells that enter, remember, the my cells don't go anywhere, they just disappear. Uh, in another place, next lecture, we'll look at the consequences of some of these things, um, of the lipid metabolism, and we'll go on and talk about atherosclerosis and things like that. Uh, they, they leave the cells after triglyceride synthesis uh, and adding protein to form chylomicrons by exocytosis. That's it. Entry to blood, can't get into the capillaries, get into the lacteals or lymph vessels. Why are they called lacteals? Lactic like milk. Why is milk milky? Because it's got fat droplets in it. So these things in life look milky because they've got fat droplets in at that stage in digestion. That's why they're called lacteals. Purely descriptive terminology before anybody knew about lymph vessels. So, and they join the circulation near the right atrium. So that's our scheme, and we've succeeded. We've taken big molecules, we've gotten down into little molecules that we can deal with inside cells, and we've got the stuff eventually into the circulation where we can use it as a fuel or store it. Water, one slide only, very easy. Water's little, and so are the ions that are in there. You take in that much water a day, more if you're on the batter, I suppose, uh, but more or less, an average sort of intake is about two litres a day. The gut secretes about seven litres a day. Seven litres a day. That's what's that. Twice your plasma volume. Obviously, your plasma volume is replaced, otherwise you'd be dead. Uh, your output from the gut is of the order of 100 mils per day in the faeces, directly. Everything else is reabsorbed. That tells you you reabsorb virtually all the fluid that goes into the gut. So you've only got about 100 mils lost in the feces. So it's a pretty good absorptive system. The absorptive mechanism is passive. Now, isn't that a good idea? If you've got to absorb 9 litres, that's a lot of stuff. If you can do it for free, that's very good. You don't have to expend lots of energy there. And there is an osmotic gradient. All cells pump out sodium. Gut cells tend to pump out sodium on their basal and lateral surfaces. Not at the sides, not at the tops, but the basolateral surface. So that creates a gradient, an osmotic gradient, between the outside, that's to say the lumen of the gut, and the space, the fluid, below the gut cells. So that acts to draw the water across the cells, or better, between the cells, because that's easier. So most of the water goes by this paracellular route beside the cells through the leaky tight junctions. That seems paradoxical, doesn't it? The leakiness can be regulated, but that doesn't concern us here. So that's their main route. So you go past the cells, osmotic gradient formed by somewhat selective sodium pumping over the basolateral <coughs> surfaces. And most of the absorption, the vast majority of the absorption, takes place in the small intestine uh, and not further down. So small intestine does most of it and everything else is just tidying up afterwards. <laughs> right, oh, great stuff. Seven minutes, six and a half to do celiac disease and possibly finish with diarrhoea. Lovely. Nothing like finishing with diarrhoea. Here is our pathology again, normal pathology. I remind you of the uh, structure of the crypt. Cells that are produced down here migrate upwards, as I said last day, and that's how it works. <coughs> then you've got normal pathology. Now, celiac disease is caused by uh, an intolerance to a component of wheat flour. So this normally would be expressed in infants that are weaned, especially if they are weaned too early. In other words, their diet has changed from an all-milk diet 
to a diet containing perhaps milk and wheat flour. So this, the normal sort of rearing practice for children is to add something containing wheat flour, wheat flour to their bottle or to their milk if they're on the, if they're on the bottle. So not, a, not if they're not on the bottle, obviously. So you supplement their diet. Now if you do that too early, the gut is still a bit leaky. And you can get set up, uh, in susceptible individuals, you can set up a gluten intolerance, so a component of wheat flour. So you've got a failure of proliferation. We know what that leads to. It leads to loss of the villi. So what are the likely consequences of this? I'm asking you and I'm expecting you to tell me. Say something. Shout something at me. All right, don't shout something at me. Say again? Malnourishment. Malnourishment. Yes, very good. Malnourishment. Yes, good. You're, you've got now flat, you've reduced the surface area. You can't absorb. Maybe you can't digest either. Malnourishment. Anything else? Malabsorption leading to what goes in and isn't absorbed comes out. Diarrhea. Thank you, sir. Well done. We have it all. So reduced absorptive capacity gives you diarrhea and what's called in the jargon failure to thrive. You get a crabby little infant, probably dehydrated, the old fontanelle going down a bit on the top, you know, um, and it's got a sore bottom, it's possibly smelly, uh, but it's got a sore bottom because of diarrhea. You've got a very worried parent or parents um, dealing with that. This child isn't gaining weight, it's pretty fractious and it's got diarrhea. Potentially life-threatening. Diarrhea in infants, very small infants, is potentially life-threatening from dehydration. So that's okay. So you treat all of those, and, it, and eventually you suspect it's that. So the easy thing to do is withdraw wheat flour immediately. So this is fine. Here's your management. Withdraw the wheat flour from the diet. Just eliminate it completely. Not an easy thing to do. We eat quite a lot of cakes and bread and biscuits and all of those things. It's not easy but you eliminate it. Easier in small children because they don't have any control. Uh, you get normal function. You get normal biopsy returns. So this gives you uh, what I like to think of as a natural control experiment. I mean, you could repeat this endless amounts of times. It's a classic experiment of being able to stimulate a response, withdraw the stimulus, and the response goes away again. That's a classic natural experiment. Now it's a bit unethical to keep doing it in small children or indeed in grown-ups either uh, and if you do it very often they may sue or their parents may sue but it's a very nice experiment and it can in fact it has been demonstrated uh, endless times. So it's a very simple piece of management. All down to one defect you cannot proliferate sufficiently in those cells. All right we could do diarrhea in one slide. Here we are since it says in the book I have to talk about diarrhea, here we go. A simple slide, list of causes, bog standard stuff. You've got excessive motility. Something stimulates the gut wall to contract in its normal way. That will move the contents faster than normal. If you move the contents faster than normal, you inhibit absorption. There isn't the time. The transit time is a lovely expression. The transit time is too great for effective absorption. Some of those things that call that stress can do it for you, central nervous system. Uh, and various kinds of infection can do it for you. Uh, so irritation of some kind, increased motility. Anything that generates stretch in the gut will also generate increased motility. Various osmotically active particles. So lactose intolerance, for example, that's the inability to digest lactose normally, will lead to the accumulation of lactose molecules in the gut, and therefore, you have a higher osmotic uh, pressure in the gut, retaining fluid in the gut. Remember that osmosis is a colligative property. There's a nice word for you. It depends on the number of particles in the gut. Not the actual molecules, doesn't matter what they are, the number of particles. Retain your lactose, you will retain fluid, you will have diarrhea. Particular toxins, particular the cholera toxin, not terribly common around here these days, but we do a lot of travelling. Uh, and it can be picked up, and you get increased fluid secretion in that case. It stimulates fluid secretion into the gut. So that's affecting the input to the gut instead of the output or the movement. Oops, sorry. Uh, signs and symptoms, obviously production of watery faeces and possibly in quite large quantities. Loss of fluid from the body, dehydration, 
and you get acid-base imbalance. Happily, I don't have to explain to you about acid-base imbalance. You have talked about some of that with, is it Stuart who talks about cardiovascular to you? Yes? Large Australian person? Yes? Yeah, that's Stuart. There aren't too many of him about, fortunately. Uh, so acid-base imbalance, which leads to all sorts of other complicated signs and symptoms, and possibly malnutrition, because of failure to absorb. Okie doke. Thank you very much. Talk to you another day. Good day.